do you foresee a time when, in fact, the Beatles won't be together and that you'll all be on your no, own? No, no. Do you get to, you, have you got tired of each other? No. Are the Beatles going to go their own ways in 1967? They could be, you know, on our own or together. We're always involved with each other, whatever we're doing. If you never taught again, would it worry you? Uh, I don't know. No, I don't think so. Do you think that in the new year that you're going to be going your own ways instead of being no. a group? No. No? No, George. What about another word? We're some few hundred miles behind enemy lines. He said, green, green, green. So I did. But I was really too scared to walk away. I was thinking, well, this is like the end, really. You know, there's no more touring. And I was dead nervous, so I, I said yes to Dick Lester that I would make this movie with him. I went to Almeria, Spain for six weeks just to, because I didn't know what to do. How, what do you do when you don't tour? There's no life. Ringo came to, to Spain right, to Almeria, when John and I were down there. Yeah, I went and hung out because he was lonely. And, you know, we really supported each other a lot. And so, you know, he was out there being this, this actor. You know, John was doing How I Won the War, so I went to India. I think I went for about six weeks. And uh, it was a fantastic time. I just, you know, would go out and look at temples and go shopping. and. You know, we travelled all over, we went to various places, and that was uh, incredible times for me. To me, you know, if you are blessed with the ability to sort of write music, um, film scores were kind of an interesting um, diversion. And George Martin, being able to write and being able to orchestrate and being pretty good at that, um, I think got an offer through the Bolting Brothers to, for him and me to do some film music for The Family Way. So I had a look at the film, I thought it was a great film, I still do, it's very powerful, emotional, soppy, but good film, I think, for its time. We actually even got an Ivan Novello Award for the best film song that year. <laughs> But it meant we could get into the studio and start with uh, Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane and that, and then Pepper. Were they the first ones? I don't know, were they? I mean, <laughs> I seem to remember that was like what happened once we got full time into the studio. And, and saying at the time, now our performance is that record. And that new record started with Strawberry Fields. And that was going to be what became Pepper. It wasn't Pepper. No one heard of Pepper but it was going to be a record that was going to be made in the studio and they, it was going to be songs which they had written which couldn't be performed live. They were designed to be um, studio productions and that was the difference. Penny Lane is in my ears and in my eyes. And then Penny Lane was a little bit more surreal too, although a sort of cleaner thing. I was into, I remember saying to George Martin, what like a very clean recording. I was into, um, clean sounds, maybe Beach Boy-y kind of things at that point. But you know, the fireman with his hourglass and all of that sort of stuff. Um, was us trying to get into a bit of art, a bit of surrealism. And they were all based on real things. Penny Lane is a, not only a street, but it's a district. I lived in Penny Lane in a street called Newcastle Road. So I was the only actual person that lived in Penny Lane. I understand from through the grapevine that Paul McCartney really, really liked Pet Sounds, you know? And then, then they go in the studio and they do Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And I said, there's their creative explosion, you know? I, they exploded in creati with creativity, you know? I guess Pet Sounds really got to Paul and John, you know? I was blown out. I couldn't believe it, you know? Well, really, it was Paul who'd been on a train journey or a plane journey with Mal Evans. 
and come up with this idea of Sgt. Pepper. And he was just kind of, to, to me, we were just in the studio to make the next record, and he was going on about this idea of, um, you know, some fictitious band. Sgt. Pepper is Paul after a trip to America, and, and the whole West Coast long named group thing was coming in. You know, when people are no longer the Beatles or the Crickets, they were suddenly threading these incredible sh shrinking grateful aeroplanes, right? At the time, there were lots of those sort of bands that were, you know, Laughing Joe and his medicine band, thank you, Wham Bam Mam, kind of group names, you know. Colonel Tucker's Medicinal Brew and Compound. So I just thought, oh, well, you know, if there was a band, what would be a mad name for it? It was basically Paul's idea to, to call Pepper. He came in and said, you know, he had this song, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Arts Club Band, and he, he, he was kind of identifying it with the band, the Beatles themselves. And the, the, I think we recorded the song first, and then the idea came to make it into a, an idea for the, for the album. Probably the most momentous song on the album, A Day in the Life, began in a very simple way. John and I sat down and he had um, this opening verse. I think he'd got the idea, or, or, or we then took the idea from like the Daily Mirror or something. So it had two stories. One was the Guinness child had killed himself in a car. Uh -huh. That was the main headline story. Uh, on the next page was about 4,000 holes in Blackburn, Lancashire. So the, the, the Blackburn, Lancashire, the holes, Albert Hall, all just sort of just got mixed, you know, just a little poetic jumble that sounded nice. But the moment I remember was when um, we got to a little bit that he didn't have, where we sort of said, I'd love to turn you on. And we like looked at each other and think like, You'd, we know what we're doing here, don't we? We're actually saying for the first time ever, like words like turn you on, you know. And, which, had, which was in the culture anyway, but no one had actually said it on record yet. And there was a little sort of look of recognition between us, like. So, you know, the sleeve came and we wanted to dress up and we wanted to be these people, you know, the peppers. <laughs> and, uh, you know, let's get suits. And, you know, it was flower power. I mean, coming into its fullest, you know, that's, that's what it was. And you know, people had come round and said, oh, great album, man. So it got very noticed as sort of, it was like you were making it for us, our crowd. I think it did represent what the young people were on about. And it seemed to coincide with a, a revolution in, in young people's thinking. And uh, it was the kind of, I suppose, the epitome of the swinging 60s. It sort of linked up with Mary Quant and mini skirts and all that kind of thing. And dope to a certain extent, you know, the, the freedom of sex, the freedom of, of um, soft drugs like marijuana and so on. Um, I suppose that was all a bit exciting and it, I think it did reflect its time. I thought it was great. Um, I thought it was a huge advance. Uh, I, I was very pleased because the newspapers, the musical papers had been saying recently, a month or two before, what are the Beatles up to? Drying up, I suppose. And so it was nice making an album like Pepper thinking, mm -hmm, yeah, drying up, that's, that, I suppose that's right, yeah. So it was lovely to have that on them, you know. Well, Sergeant Pepper for me was great because I, it, it's a fine album. For me it was kind of a bit tiring or it was a bit boring because, um, I mean, I had a few moments in there that I enjoyed, but generally I didn't really like that album much. My heart was still in India, you know. It wasn't that spectacular, I mean, when you look back on it. I mean, like anything, it was great then. But uh, people just have this dream about Pepper. Uh, it was good for them, you know. Paul, how often have you taken LSD? About uh, four times. I don't know, it just seems strange to me because we'd been trying to get him to take it for about 18 months. And then it just seemed funny that one day he's on the television talking all about it. The problem was it then gave the press a field day to be on all our cases, you know. I personally didn't think it was any of their business. Uh, but, you know, once he said it, uh, you know, whoever said anything in the Beatles, the other three had to deal with it, you know, which we did in, with all love because, you know, we loved each other. But uh, I could have done without it myself. 
Now, the point about the whole drug scene was the press asked Paul, have you taken LSD? This is how it all came out. Otherwise, we didn't say a word about it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just a, a personal right. thing, mm -hmm. right? Love, love, love. It was supposedly the very first satellite hookup around the world. I don't know how many millions of people, but it was supposed to be some phenomenal amount of people. And it was a, probably the very earliest technology that enabled that kind of satellite link. John wrote All You Need Is Love specially for the television show. Um, it was a commission that was Brian suddenly went world in and said, we are to represent Britain in this round the world hookup and you've got to, you've got to write a song. And we had prepared a track, a basic track for the recording for the television show, but we were going to do a lot live. And there was an orchestra that was live, and the singing was live, and certain audience and so on. And we knew it was going to be a live television show. The man upstairs pointed his finger, and that's it. We did it one take. It was just exciting times. And all for this loving feeling. So <clears throat> at that point, I'm, I'm, I stopped taking it, actually. The, the dreaded lysergic, <laughs> it's like old rope, and I thought, well, I, I'm not going to put that in my brain anymore. I was influenced by acid and got psychedelic, you know, like the whole generation. But really, I like rock and roll, you know. Just one of those things that happened, you know, <laughs> as life went on. We'd been into drugs, and we were, you know, the next step then is then you've got to try and find a meaning then. That's where I really went for the um, meditation. And there's this thing called a mantra. Through the mantra, you, you can follow a technique that helps you to transcend, that is, to go beyond the waking, sleeping, dreaming state. So I got myself to the point where, OK, I need a mantra. Uh, you know, where do you go? You know, go to Harrods and get a mantra. But then I met David Wynne, who said, showed me this picture, and he said, oh, he's coming to do a lecture at the Hilton. It's called Maharishi. So I said, OK, I'll go. I got some tickets. And then I thought, well, I'll get some in case the others want to go. Oh, yeah, all right. Who went along. And I thought he made a lot of sense, you know. Um, I think we all did because he basically said that with a simple system of meditation, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, no big sort of crazy thing, you can improve the quality of life and sort of find some sort of meaning in doing so. I, I seem to recall it was a phone call that somebody came uh, to us in, in this place in Bangor and said... Uh, and that he died. That was kind of stunning, because we were off on this sort of finding the meaning of life, and there he was, dead. We were all gutted, you know. It was, um, it was, it was a huge shock, of course, because he was like one of our... one of the people we'd known longest, you know, and, and huge confidant of ours, and we just knew him very well. And, you know, when anyone dies like that, it's just the shock of them being wrenched out of the picture, you go, oh, I'm not going to see him anymore. And it was just, you know, blood drained from the face, you know, saying, Brian's dead. And there was very little we knew other than that he'd been found dead. And we just knew, well, that's it, we got to... It was very strange for it to happen at that precise moment. We just got involved with this meditation. I knew that we were in trouble then. I didn't really have any misconceptions about our ability to do anything other than play music. I was scared, you know. I thought, we fucking had it now. It was a huge void. We didn't know anything about, you know, our personal um, business and finances. And, you know, he'd t just taken care of everything. And I suppose it was, uh, it was chaos after that. We were kind of managing ourselves, really. It was sad, you know, it was very sad to lose an old mate under those circumstances. But uh, I don't think the major worry was, oh, what are we going to do now? We haven't got a manager. Because I say, we'd been moving away from that. We're suddenly like chickens without heads. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? 
you know, that's where Neil kind of stepped in and tried to figure out what was happening. We decided we needed, uh, we needed a, an office and an organization of our own, you know, and that's uh, really why we expanded Apple, because Apple already existed. You know, it was, uh, I think it was a publishing company on, uh, in an office on Baker Street. Paul made an attempt to carry on as if Brian hadn't died, you know. I think Paul had an impression. We should be thankful for what he did, you know, for, for keeping the Beatles going. It was Paul's idea. It was basically a sharabang trip, which people used to go on from Liverpool to see the Blackpool lights. We knew we weren't doing a regular film. We were doing a crazy, roly-poly 60s film. We, I am the Eggman, you were the, you know, and I just wandered off to France and did that um, Fool on the Hill stuff. I remember um, quite a bit of it, really, in the big hangar down in Kent. I think it's quite interesting now, looking back on it as a period piece. And people like Spielberg, I've read that people like him have sort of said, when I was in film school, we re that was a film we really took notice of, like an art film, you know, rather than a proper film. But of course, we then released it, um, got it shown on the BBC on Boxing Day. And of course, they showed it in black and white. And so it was hated. You know, they all had their chance then to say they've gone too far. Who do they think they are? What does it mean? From the noise and pace of city life in the cool, clear air of Rishikesh, North India, Pathy News reports from the meditation retreat of Maharishi Maharishi Yogi, the man who, through transcendental meditation, is currently bringing peace of mind to the Beatles. Rishikesh is an incredible place. I mean, we were really away from everything. It was like a sort of recluse holiday camp, you know right at the foot of the Himalayas. It was like being up a mountain, but they call it the foothills, hanging over the Ganges. It was very much like a kind of summer camp. You would get up in the morning, you would go down to a little communal breakfast. Food was veggie, which is kind of good for me now, but thinking back on it, it was, I was still meat eating then, so it was, it was all right though, it was sort of curries and stuff, you know. But at the end of my month, I was quite happy and I thought, this will do me. This is fine. If I want to get into it heavy, I can do it anywhere. That's one of the nice things about it. It's like you don't have to go to church to do it. Do it in your own room. I didn't come back um, with the others anyway. I don't recall. I think Ringo probably came back quickly. He just went for a couple of weeks, just like, just to put his toe in the water and see what it was like, maybe. Uh, I and Paul just came and, and went. We were there four months, or George and I were. No, it we was lost good, thirteen didn't... pounds, and we looked a day older. Did you? Uh, you think this man's on the level? I don't know what yeah. level he's on, but uh, <laughs> he's on the we level. had a nice holiday in India and came back rested to play businessman. And we sat in the mountains eating lousy vegetarian food Everything. and writing all those songs. You know, wrote tons of songs in India. Achoo! Achoo! <laughs> But we were into kind of psychedelic stuff with Pepper and those kind of things. So they wanted more of that kind of stuff. Um, so it was up to them anyway. So we went along with that and they had all the sea of holes and all that stuff, which I think seeing it now is pretty good. You know, it, it's quite interesting really. Yeah, I like the film. I think it's a classic film. I, I'm not sure why we never did our own voices, but the, probably the actors probably did it better anyway. You know, because you need it to be more cartoon like I mean, our voices were pretty cartoon-like anyway, but, you know, the exaggeration that you've got with the other actors' voices, I think it suits it. But that's where all of that stuff came from, you know, that sort of terrible fake Liverpool accent, hello. But that film does go for uh, every generation, every baby 
You know, three, four-year-old goes through yellow submarine. Everybody seemed to be paranoid, except for us two who were in the glow of love. You know, everything's clear and open when you're in love, and everybody sort of was tense around us, and, you know, what what is she doing here at the session, or why is she with him, and all this sort of madness is going on around us, because we just happen to be wanting to be together all the time. And, uh, they were, from that point on, never to be seen without each other, you know, for the next few years at least. Trouble was for us, um, it encroached on our framework that we had going basically it's only ever been the four of us in the studio maybe with uh, Neil and Mal as the two roadies or George Martin up in the control room often he only ever came down occasion or an engineer came down to fix a mic but that was it and uh, in our whole recording career that had been the setup and again you know I used to just ask John what's this about and I said you know it's what is happening here yokers at all the sessions and uh... And he told me straight away, I said, well, you know, when you go home to, to Maureen and you tell her how your day was, you know, takes you like two lines, oh, we had a good day in the studio. And he says, well, we know exactly what's going on. You know, and that's how they started to live. Every moment together. Suddenly one day, I think, Neil or somebody said, oh, he's Ringo's gone on holiday. I felt two things. I felt I wasn't playing great and the other three were really happy and I was an outsider. And so, you know, I came to this decision, fuck it, I'm leaving. You know, and I knew we were just in a messed up stage, all of us, uh, then. You know, it wasn't just me, it was the whole thing was going down. And I came back and went in the studio and George had had it decked out with flowers. It's just flowers everywhere and John, had sent me telegrams saying, you're the best rock drummer, come on home. <laughs> and uh, and I just felt good about myself again, and we'd, you know, we'd got through that little crisis. Uh, a lot of the recordings, where they would have a basic idea and then they would have a jam session to end it, which sometimes didn't sound too good. Um, but, you know, this was fairly small criticism. When they did the White Album, I thought we should have made probably a very, very good single album out of it rather than making a double album. Well, no, I, I agree. We should have put it out as two separate albums, the White and the Whiter album. Uh, a lot of information on a double album. But, you know, what do you do when you've got all them songs and you want to get, um, you want to get rid of them so you can do more songs? You know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, ego in that band and, um, there was a lot of songs that should have just maybe been elbowed or made into B-sides. I think it was an album which could have been made a fantastically good album if it had been compressed a bit and condensed. But a lot of people I know think it's still the best album they made. So it's not my view, but um, horses for courses. Well, you can always say that. You know, you say, perhaps I'll go with, but not definitely. I mean, in fact, I think it's a fine little album, and I think the fact that it's got so much on it is one of the things that's cool about it. Because it's, it's the very varied stuff, you know, Rocky Raccoon, Piggies, um, Happiness of Warm Guns, that, that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, I think it's a fine album. You know, I'm, I'm not a great one for that, you know, maybe it was too many of that. Look, what do you mean? It was great, it sold, it's the bloody Beatles White album, shut up. going through a very revolutionary period at that time and uh, they were trying to think of something new. They did actually come up with a very good idea which I thought was well worth working on. They wanted to write an album completely and rehearse it 
and then perform it in front of a large audience, and for that to be a live album of new material. And um, we started rehearsing down in Twickenham Film Studio, and I, I went along with them. I'm not sure whether everybody was behind the idea of going to Twickenham. I think what they decided to do was film whatever they were doing, and they were, they were going to start making a new album. The original idea was that you'd see the Beatles rehearsing, jamming, making up stuff, getting their act together, and then finally we'd perform somewhere as the big end of show concert kind of thing. And uh, Michael Lindsay Hogg was going to direct it. I thought, OK, you know, well, it's a new year and we got some uh, new approach. But it soon became apparent that it wasn't anything new. It was just, it was just going to be painful again. I mean, you know, the days were long and uh, it could get boring, you know. And Twickenham just wasn't really conducive to any great atmosphere. We're just in that big barn. I'd just spent, like, the last six months producing an album of this fellow, Jackie Lomax, and hanging out with Bob Dylan and the band in Woodstock and having a great time. And for me to come back into the winter of discontent with the Beatles in Twickenham was um, it was very unhealthy and unhappy. It was just dreadful, dreadful feeling. And being filmed all the time, you know, like that. I just wanted them to go away and we'd be there at eight in the morning and you couldn't make music at eight in the morning or at 10 or whatever it was in a strange place with people filming you and colored lights. As everybody knows, we never had much privacy. <laughs> and, you know, this thing that was happening was they were filming us rehearsing. There was a bit of a, a row going on between Paul and I. Yeah, you can see it, where he's saying, well, don't play this or something. And I'm saying, well, you know, I'll, uh, I'll play what you want or I won't play if you don't want it. You know, just make up your mind. That kind of stuff was going on. Uh, I thought I'm quite um, capable of being relatively happy on my own and, I'm, and I'm not able to be happy in this situation. You know, I'm getting out of here. I think I'll be leaving the band now. When? Now. The whole pressure of it finally got to us. So instead of, you know, like people do when they're together, they start picking on each other. You know, it was like, it's because of you, you'd got the tambourine wrong that my whole life is a misery. You know, it became petty, but the manifestations were on each other because we were the only ones we had. But it was like, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, George has left and, you know, we, we can't have this, this isn't good enough, you know. So we, I, I'm not sure how, what happened, but I think maybe Neil or one of the, you know, the, who looked after us would probably ring George up and say, you know, they, they're real sorry or whatever, it was a mistake and it was like... I remember being called to a meeting that was out in Elstead in Surrey, it was at Ringo's house that he bought from Peter Sellers. And it was decided that it would be better if we just got back together and finished the record. Also, you see, Twickenham Studio was very cold and not a very nice atmosphere, so we decided to abandon that and go to Savile Row into the recording studio. I think everyone was getting a little tired of us by then because we were taking a long time and there was many discussions going on by then, many heated discussions. Billy Preston was a great help. He was a very good keyboard guy. And um, I mean, his work on Get Back alone justified him being there. And he was, a, he was an amiable fellow too, very nice. And he was a kind of, yes, he was a kind of emollient, if you like. He, he helped to lubricate the, the, the friction that had been there. It's interesting to see how people behave nicely when you bring a guest in, because they don't really want everybody to know that they're so bitchy. And this happened back in uh, the White Album when I brought Eric Clapton in to play on While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Suddenly everybody's on their best behavior. So I put a message out uh, to find if Billy was in town and told him to come in to Savile Row, which he did. Straight away just became 100% improvement in the vibe in the room. And everybody was happier also to have somebody else playing in the band. 
we were working on a good track and that always excited us. And his part was also a part of it. So, you know, suddenly, you know, when you were working on something good, the bullshit went out the window and we got back down to doing what we did really, really well. When we sat down to play, we played good from the very beginning, from when we first got Ringo into the band and before. But when we first got Ringo into the band, it really gelled. We played good. And we'd never had too many of those times where it's just not working. We had them like any other band, but often, you know, just for a great little rock and roll band, we could just play, play any little, you know, blues, little rock and roll things. And it, and it seemed to work, it seemed to gel. The idea being that we were gonna, originally we were gonna rehearse all these new songs and then make an album in a live show. Never really happened because the album became us in the studio as we rehearsed the songs they were recorded you know they were you know they were talking about doing a, a concert on a boat or a concert in an amphitheater in greece or you know uh, maybe at the roundhouse in london there was lots of different ideas about where they should uh, maybe do a concert and uh, nothing was ever really agreed because that was uh, looking for an end to the film really it was one of those, well, are we going to finish this then? There's not going to be a big concert. Because by then it was really, you know, looking like, well, you know, can we, can we do this, finish this in two weeks' time? And uh, so then it was suggested that we go up on the roof and do a concert there. Then we could all go home. Don't let me down. And we thought, well, that's an end. You know, Beatles busted on rooftop gig, you know. The thing on the roof that always I feel let down about with the police, you know, because someone in the neighborhood called the police and the police came up and I was playing away and I said, oh, great. You know, I hope they drag me off. You know, I wanted the cops to drag me off, get off those drums, you know, because we were being filmed and it would have been really great. Well, they didn't, of course. They just came bumbling in. You've got to turn that sound down. <laughs> you know, so could have been fabulous. <laughs> In fact, what happened was when we got in there, it, it, we showed how the breakup of a group works. No, we didn't realize that we were actually sort of breaking up, you know, as it was happening. Just the same as it was before, you know, the year before, when we were last in the studio. There was a lot of um, kind of trivia and games that were being played. Well, I think it shows as an absolute fact that we were going different places, you know. You know, I've mentioned it before, the energy for the Beatles was waning. You know, we put in a thousand percent and then it was dwindling now. It's like, oh dear, do we have to turn up? We have to do that thing again. I want to do this and John wants to do that and, you know, George was off and, you know, people would, you know, we had families. and. I remember thinking of it like army buddies. We, we, one of the songs we used to love in the past was Wedding Bells. Those wedding bells are breaking up, that old gang of mine. And this idea that you've been army buddies, but one day you have to kiss the army goodbye and go and get married and act like normal people. It was a bit like that for the Beatles. We always knew that day had to come. To live with four people over and over for years and years, which is what we did, and we called each other every name under the sun. We'd got to blows. We'd been through the whole damn show. We knew where we were at, we still do. We'd been through the mill together for more than 10 years. You know. We'd been through our therapy together many times, you know? You know, and in a lot of days, even with all the craziness, it really works still. Instead of working every day, it worked like two days a month, yeah. you know? Well, then there, there were still good days. We were still really close friends, you know. Then it would split off again into some madness. You know, it was quite obvious that the Beatles became, you know, I mean, the thing that it started out being, it gave us a vehicle to be able to do so much when we were younger and then we grew right through that. But it got to a point where it was stifling us. There was too much restriction you know, it had to self-destruct. Klein had been managing the Rolling Stones, and I believe Donovan, 
and uh, John had met him, and he just came in one day and said, well, I'm going to get Klein to manage me. And that's what's happening. And Alan was a, a human being, but the same as Brian was a human being. You know, I mean, it was the same thing with Brian in the early days. It was assessment. And, and, and I make a lot of mistakes character-wise, you know. But now and then I make a good one, you know. The alternative to Klein, really, um, was possibly Lee Eastman. I'd put forward Lee Eastman, uh, Linda's dad, as a possible sort of lawyer and possibly someone to do. But uh, they said, no, no, he'd be just too biased against you, um, for you and against us, which I could see. Oh, yeah, well, we had great arguments with Paul. Well, the three of us felt, oh, the three of us have gone this way, you know, why don't you? So there it was, and that then was a three-to-one situation. And in the Beatles, um, if any one doesn't agree with the plan, it was always vetoed. It's very democratic that way. So the three-to-one thing was very awkward. What changed at Apple after he arrived? Everything. It was a completely different situation, you know. Number one, right, first and foremost, Paul wasn't there. At the end of Let It Be, Let It Be was such an un unhappy record, really, even though there's some great songs on it. I really thought that was the end of the Beatles, and I thought I would never work with them again. And I thought, what a shame to go out there like this. So I was quite surprised when Paul rang me up and said, we're going to make another record. Would you like to produce it? And my immediate answer was, only if you let me produce it the way we used to. And he said, we, we, do, we do want to do that. I said, John included. He said, yes, honestly. I said, well, if you really want to do that, let's do it and let's get together again. And it was a very happy record. I guess it was happy because everybody knew it was going to be the last. Well, I think the deal was that, you know, through Let It, Let it Be, it was like we, I left and we got back on the basis that we've got to just finish it up, make it tidy. So I got back on that basis. Then everybody decided, well, we ought to do one better album. I think it shows on the record that when we were excited, the track's excited, you know, it, it's really um, all comes together. It doesn't matter what we're going through as individuals, you know, on the bullshit level. When it gets to the music, when you can see that it's really cool, we all put in the thousand percent. You're making an album and Towards the end of the album, you start thinking, well, we need a title for this. So you're looking around, you're fishing around. And the engineer, Jeff Emmerich, who is our, our Beatle engineer, who did all the great sounds for us, was smoking cigarettes called Everest. They're like a kind of menthol right. cigarette at the time. And we kind of looked at that and said, Everest? It's, it's kind of, you know, it's big, it's heroic. That could be good for the album. And just one day we were in Abbey Road working, and I just sort of said, well, look, you know, why not Abbey Road? Because if we did that, we could just run outside. Right. There's, a, there's a level crossing, as we call it, out there, Zebra Crossing. And we could just stand there, we could get photographed, come back to work, it'd take two seconds. Right. I said, and it's not a bad title, you know, Abbey Road. Uh, that's a long story. But there was a meeting where John came in and said, hey guys, I'm leaving the group. Then we were discussing something in the office with Paul and uh, Paul was saying something or other, like, like to do something or... And I kept saying no, no, no uh, to everything he said, you see. So it came to a point I had to say something. You know, Paul said, well, what do you mean? And so I said, I mean, I, I, the group's over, I'm leaving. Paul and Alan said they were glad that I wasn't going to announce it, that I was going to make an event out of it, you know. I was a fool not to do it, you know. Not to do what Paul did, which is use it to sell a record. There was always a possibility, though, you know, we could have carried on.